Welcome back to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We'll be back with today's guest, but first let's hear from our podcast sponsors. We want to thank Violet Defense for their support of the Educational AD Podcast. Go to violetdefense.com for more information. Violet Defense is dedicated to protecting our world from germs by bringing the power of UV disinfection to everyday spaces. Their patented technology enables them to harness the power of the sun to incorporate ultraviolet light into products and environments like never before. Whether you're ready to implement existing products, or if you'd like to explore researching and developing a custom deployment of their technology for your school, Violet Defense has the solutions and the experience you need. Once again, go to violetdefense.com for more information. We also want to thank Sideline Interactive. You know, it's becoming harder and harder to fund an athletic department, but Sideline's interactive indoor scoring tables and video boards can generate $10,000 or more every year while creating excitement in the gym and the ultimate game day experience for your athletes. Go to sidelineinteractive.com or call 832-786-0302 to schedule a live web demo and see their tables and boards in action. You can also email them at sales at sidelineinteractive.com. That's sales at sidelineinteractive.com and see exactly what their fantastic products can do for you. We also want to thank Vital Signs uh, Wall of Fame. You know, they are on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. They provide a variety of interactive touchscreen video consoles and an extensive library of templates to make it easier than ever to recognize the athletic achievements of your students, both past and present. For ideas on how to showcase your school's diverse history, along with your proudest moments, visit vitalsignswalloffame.com or to learn more and get started with your own digital Wall of Fame tribute, give them a call at 614-981-3589 or email them at sales at vitalsignswalloffame.com. That's sales at vitalsignswalloffame.com. We also want to thank Huddle. Remember, at Huddle, we power sports. More than 180,000 teams, including some of the best in the world, are using Huddle to elevate the performance of their teams and athletes using video and analytics. Huddle is the complete performance platform with online tools, mobile and desktop apps, smart cameras like the Huddle Focus. Of course, there's analytics and a whole lot more. Huddle is built for every level of play starting with club and youth programs, all the way up through high school and college teams. And of course, professional organizations are using Huddle to improve their level of play. You're in pretty good company with over 6 million users, including your student athletes, a lot of their parents, and of course, the coaches of the college and university teams that you're trying to get to recruit your kids. If you want to find out more, about what Huddle can do for you and how your school can become a Huddle school, go to huddle.com and talk to their professionals. Remember, at Huddle, we power sports. We also want to thank Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you as an athletic director to improve your entire athletic program. Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack also gives you access to the 95% of the players and the parents who really love your program. And it gives them a voice to help demonstrate the importance that a positive athletic experience has for them. Go to athleticsurveys.com and check out their testimonials and then give them a call at 1-800-738-6466, or you can email them at info at athleticsurveys.com to get started. Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. If you've never used a survey to check the pulse of your players or parents, you really need to check them out. Let them help you take your athletic program from good to great. We also want to thank Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. You can learn more 
at hometownticketing.com. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We're taking another trip back to college, and uh, we're going to be visiting with Dr. Megan Halbrook. She is the director of the Master's in Coaching for Sport Leadership at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. Dr. Halbrook, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, we're excited to hear uh, about what's going on in your part of the country and also the opportunities that are available to um, athletic administrators. So let's go and jump right in. We always like to let our listeners have a chance to get to know our guests. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, where you were born, where you grew up, and maybe a little bit of the path that brought you to Randolph College. Sure. Yeah, I was born in uh, Missouri, actually about an hour south of St. Louis. And uh, a pretty small town, I guess. Um, so I was born and raised there from the time I was born to the time I graduated high school. And um, I was always very active within sport. So I remember playing sports with my cousins growing up uh, just out in the backyard, but <clears throat> got into organized sport pretty early. When I got to high school, they had just started a uh, softball team. Um, I had played boys baseball up until that point. And then um, I tried out softball and fell in love with it. So that was my main sport from there on out. But I also played soccer and uh, threw um, shot and disc for um, track and field. So tried to do something every season. And then um, I went to a community college up in St. Louis and played softball. And um, I considered transferring to a four-year school to play softball, but um, actually had a coaching opportunity come up um, the new head coach at the community college asked me to be the assistant instead of transferring. And so, um, I thought that was an interesting opportunity that I wasn't sure I'd get if I, um, hadn't been right in that specific spot. So I decided to stay, um, I transferred to a four year school and finished my undergrad, but I ended up just coaching instead of playing, which was probably fair. I was an average athlete. I wasn't anything crazy, but, um, after that, I got my um, undergrad from U University of Missouri, St. Louis, and then I transferred to Ball State, um, which is in Muncie, Indiana, for my master's degree in sport and exercise psychology. And then um, a couple of years later, I ended up going to West Virginia University um, and getting a PhD in sport and exercise psychology and another master's in community counseling. And from there, I... Uh, started, I actually worked with the military before getting back into academia. Um, so I worked at Fort Bragg in Fayetteville, North Carolina for a year and a half doing what they call master resilience training and performance enhancement with soldiers and their families. And so that was a really cool opportunity um, to work on my applied work um, for sport and exercise psychology. So the mental game, but with uh, soldiers who we call the ultimate athletes. And then um, also doing a lot of resilience training. So learning how to make people more resilient in even the toughest circumstances. Um, whenever I saw the job come across at Randolph, it was for um, a tenure track professor. I wasn't really planning on applying to any schools just yet, but uh, it seemed too good to pass up. They, they really wanted someone to come in and build some new classes, work on curriculum, and really just expand the program. And um, I, that was kind of what I was looking for. I like having that type of responsibility and some of that control in terms of trying to help the students um, reach their goals. So I took a shot. It's the only school I applied to and uh, just actually worked out. So this is my fifth year at Randolph. Um, during my third year, I actually started a master's program, which was um, a bit Unexpected. We, I wasn't expecting to do that um, as quickly as I did. But um, so right now we're in our second year of the Master of Arts in Coaching and Sport Leadership, and it's going great. Um, it's been such a, a wild ride, especially the past couple of years with everything else that's happening in the world. But um, we have managed. So it's a really long winded intro. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. Oh, no, not at all. It was all good. I want to go back to um, 
you know, you mentioned that word in, in one of your jobs, you know, with the military, you know, about resilience training, you know, as a longtime track coach, you know, we always talk about the resiliency of a, a muscle, like, you know, in the triple jump, you know, to impact mm -hmm. and then explode again. We always say as coaches that uh, athletics and sports teaches kids resiliency. Um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you train that and how you specifically honed in on that with your group. I think that's uh, very interesting. Sure. So um, with the military, it was uh, it was actually a two week class that we would have um, for soldiers and their families where they would come in and we would teach them that was 14 different skills that were supposed to be designed to um, create more resilient people. And so resilience is such a complicated concept in a lot of ways, right? Like we often tell people we want them to be mentally tough. We want them to be resilient. But, but especially younger individuals, they don't really know what that means just yet. Um, they know it makes their parents and teachers and coaches happy, but they don't actually know what it is or what it entails. And so um, with the soldiers and their families, we had all these different skills and they really ranged from a, a wide range of topics. So looking at communication patterns, um, you know, how can we communicate better? And that can build those relationships, which can make us more resilient. Looking at our thought patterns. Um, you know, what are we telling ourselves? Uh, for sports psych, we usually say self-talk is the traditional skill. You know, what do we say to ourselves when no one else is listening, right? It's just us. Um, we also focus on, uh, trying to think here, general types of um, interactions that we have maybe with other people. So building that social support aspect. We know that the more social support someone has, the more resilient they're able to be even just talking about coping resources um, and, and self-care. You know, what are we doing to take care of ourselves whenever um, we start to feel overwhelmed? We also have to consider what our general tendencies are whenever we all get stressed and we all kind of go into these reactive type of patterns. Um, whenever we get stressed, maybe that means we withdraw from people. Maybe it means that we lash out and get angry. Uh, maybe it means that we use humor. But knowing yourself is going to produce more resilient people and having the freedom um, in a way to really explore that and self-reflect is also going to give people more chances to be resilient. The, the easiest way we describe resilience is be the ball, not the egg. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that before, but if someone's resilient and you know if you're a ball and you throw it down, it bounces right back up. But if you're the egg, you get thrown down and you stay, <laughs> you stay on the ground. And so our goal is to kind of make individuals a little bit more uh, reboundable in a sense. Um, so that if something happens, which it will, that's life, um, something will happen that throws us down. You know, we have to have those skills in order to be able to bounce back up. And so that's something that kind of permeates most of what I do, I guess, even I'm having trouble putting into words, but I really spend a lot of time on the relationship aspect um, with other people. Really cool stuff. I love the, um, you know, ball versus the egg uh, analogy. Very, very, very neat. I'd, I'd love to take a deeper dive. We just don't have time today. <laughs> For our listeners, uh, we're visiting with Dr. Megan Hallbrook. She's the director of the master's in coaching and sport leadership at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. We're going to be back with some more, uh, but let's take a quick break and hear from one of our podcast sponsors. We want to thank Huddle for their support of the Educational AD podcast. Remember, at Huddle, we power sports. More than 180,000 teams, including some of the best in the world, are using Huddle to elevate the performance of their athletes and their teams using video and analytics. Huddle's the complete performance platform. They have online tools, mobile and desktop apps, smart cameras like the Huddle Focus. Of course, there's analytics and a whole lot more. Huddle's also built for every level of play, starting with the club and the youth programs, all the way up through high school and college teams. And even professional teams are using Huddle to improve the play of their athletes. You're in pretty good company 
with over 6 million users, including your student athletes, a lot of their parents, and the coaches of the college and university teams that you're trying to get your kids recruited to. If you want to find out more about what Huddle can do for you and how your school can become a Huddle school, go to huddle.com and talk to their professionals. Remember, at Huddle, we power sports. Hey, welcome back to our visit with Dr. Megan Halbrook from Randolph College in Lynchburg. Uh, doctor, uh, we always like to ask our guests about the mentors that they've had in their life. So the expression I like to use is, I still hear those voices in my head uh, when I'm talking to a kid or a coach or maybe a parent. So do you have any voices that you hear uh, that have helped you along the way? Yes, absolutely. This is always such a neat thing to think about too, uh, because as we go back and now in the role I'm in, you know, trying to be a mentor myself, uh, there's a lot that I often think about from my past and I pull from some of those, uh, those nuggets of wisdom that other people have shared with me. I think one of the first mentors I had was probably my high school softball coach. Um, it was Coach Walden, and he was a wonderful man. And uh, is a wonderful man. He he still lives in Missouri with his with his family, and it's been. Uh, I remember because I was new to softball, I was really uncertain, and um, he was always just a voice of positivity, of optimism, uh, really giving me a lot of feedback, um, which I like. I like having feedback so I can improve, and then um, he was also just someone that was really easy to talk to. And so I remember, you know, coming into high school, it's a lot, um, a lot of changes. And um, he always believed in me. I never doubted for a day that he believed that um, I could achieve so much. And so that was always a really great um, memory. And I actually, the other day, uh, um, I was upset after a game one day and everyone else had left. Um, and I was sitting there on the bench and he came up and, and I was just one after the other. I should have done this better. I should have done this better. And uh, he said, you know what? I said, what? He goes, I bet the sun still rises tomorrow. And uh, I just thought, I just found that so profound. <laughs> you know, we, we get in our head all the time about things we should do better. And at the end of the day, we're going to have another opportunity, um, hopefully. And so, um, you know, I, I shared that with some of our stressed master's students the other day. Um, but other than that, I would say a lot of my professors um, and advisors once I got to graduate school. So with their background in coaching and just with their background in education and in the sports psychology field, I leaned on them a lot um, to learn about research and to learn about teaching and to learn just about how to balance, I think, is about a big part of it. Um, I've had some really incredible advisors who are very active in the field, uh, but also have families and are able to really uh, navigate that work-life balance in a way that's impressive, especially now as, as I venture further into my career. So um, I've always leaned to them um, for, for laughs, to commiserate, and uh, I'd say they're probably my biggest that I focus on now. But in terms of sport, definitely my high school coach. Yeah, um, it's so, um, it's funny to hear, not funny, I it's great to hear. Uh, so many of our guests go all the way back to their high school coaches. And uh, I, I love to tell the story, our high school football team, you know, we won three games in three years. Uh, oh, wow. And it, it was never about, oh, you know, our coach sucks or, or something like that, because he and the rest of the staff, they made it so much fun. Um, it, it was always, uh, you know, hey, we're going to win this week. We're, we always had that faith. We always had that hope. Um, and he, he had an expression that I, I chuckle more about now than back then. But, uh, you know, it was usually every Friday night after a game. You know, he would say, well, man, half the teams in the country lost tonight. Uh, and it's true. Okay? Yeah. But, uh, I, again, just it, it's, it's great to hear um, how many uh, people have that positive experience uh, from their coaches, you know, back in high school. Very cool stuff. Um, 
as we said, you are the director, and um, I didn't know this, you started, you know, the uh, program, the master's yeah. in coaching and sport leadership there at Randolph. Mm -hmm. uh, tell our listeners a little bit about it, you know, give us some broad brush strokes, you know, what does it entail? Uh, and then, you know, maybe just a little tease, uh, you know, why they should be involved, and then we'll take a deeper dive later in the show. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something I'm obviously very passionate about. Um, it took a lot of work to get it started. And uh, I think we're really seeing the, the dividends already, um, even within two years. And so the, we call it the Maxwell program. So the Master of Arts in Coaching and Sport Leadership. So Maxwell uh, is a one-year program, which I think makes it a little bit unique. And uh, we start in the summer and end the following May. And it's intentionally coaching and sport leadership uh, so that we really try to produce individuals who are holistically trained in both coaching and in some ways sport administration. Um, and so it's a one year, you can actually do the program fully online um, or you can be a residential student. So we have two different tracks um, that individuals can come in and, uh, and do. And so right now we have eight students that are online, eight students that are in person. And, um, you know, I think they're really thriving and it's broken up into seven week sessions. So um, this week is our seventh week. So we're getting ready to wrap up the semester and um, this session for our students. All right. Well, again, uh, there's a lot of programs out there. I think they all have, you know, their own value. We're going to find out a little bit more about the specifics of the program at Randolph College when we come back. Uh, once again, for listeners, we're visiting with Dr. Megan Halbrook. She's the director of the Masters in Coaching and Sport Leadership at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. We'll be right back, but let's hear uh, from another one of our podcast sponsors. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We also want to thank Sideline Interactive for their support. You've heard me say that we have a sideline interactive video scoring table in our gym, and it is a fantastic product. You really need to check them out. You know, it's becoming harder and harder to fund an athletic department these days, but sideline interactives, indoor scoring tables, and video boards can generate $10,000 or more every year, while also creating excitement in the gym and the ultimate game day experience for your student athletes. Go to sidelineinteractive.com or call 832-786-0302 to schedule a live web demo and see their tables and boards in action. You can also email them at sales at sidelineinteractive.com and find out exactly what these fantastic products can do for you. That's sales at sidelineinteractive.com. You won't be disappointed. Please check them out. We're back with Dr. Megan Halbrook from Randolph College. Megan, you mentioned earlier that um, the Masters in Sport Coaching and Leadership is, is a young program, but you also mentioned it's you know fully accessible online. Let's do that deep dive into it. Tell us you know uh, about specific courses, you know requirements, electives. You know, uh, you know, I'll ask the question: Why should our listeners you know get involved with the program at Randolph College? Yeah, obviously a great question and one that most people want to know. There's obvious, there's options out there. Um, so students have the ability to essentially search and find a program that fits for them. And so one unique aspect about Randolph is that we are a community of 600 students. Um, we're extremely small. Um, you know, our undergraduate is a private liberal arts school. Um, we have a history of being a women's college. Um, recently went co-ed about 13, 14 years ago. And so uh, the master's program was really developed because we had such a strong showing of undergrad students who are interested um, in sport and exercise studies. And so whenever we developed the program, we had them in mind as well as the already working coach, which is why we have the online component specifically is for individuals who are already in uh, athletic directing roles, sport administration, or already coaching, with the online program, you can work and do the program. So it doesn't have to be something where you take a year off and do it. However, we do have the residential option as well. Um, most 
most of our residential students are going to be those individuals who are coming straight out of undergrad um, or who are recently out of undergrad that who can relocate um, and do want to spend most of their time on campus. We are the first program at Randolph College to have graduate assistants as well. And so that's been really neat uh, because we're able to pair up students with coaches, um, with our athletic director, with sports information even, um, and give them a really unique experience that's tailored to what they wanna do after the program. Because we're such a small school, that's pretty much what we do. We have, we focus so closely on building those good relationships with students, tailoring courses, tailoring um, oversight and mentorship to that student specifically. Um, I always tell people, prospective students that Randolph is not ever cookie cutter. Um, we are specifically looking at making sure that our students leave with the best experience that they can get and that they're set up for success after graduation. So whenever I put together the program, I really had to think about what was going to work best. And because we are small, uh, we only have one entry point. So students, every student will start in the summer. Um, and I think that's great because it creates that cohort feel, which is something I really valued in graduate school. So going through the program with the same people for the entire time, and you really build strong relationships, which only helps you after you get out, because then you have those people that you can lean on and call. And it's good peer support that you have as soon as you leave the program that doesn't just go away. So um, the online students also interact with our in-person students. So it just builds their network even further. So um, some of our uh, classes are totally online, even if you're an in-person student. So that also opens up availability for graduate assistants or for individuals who wanna utilize their fifth year of eligibility. We have a lot of that with the COVID-19 um, pandemic where students lost that year and now they're gonna be able to get it back. And so um, we have two students right now who are utilizing their fifth year of eligibility and doing the program. Um, as far as classes go, we have um, it's a 36 credit masters. Um, so just like many other masters, we just managed to fit it in one year. And uh, because the classes are broken up into seven week sections, they take two classes every seven weeks and then also do a practicum each seven weeks. So some students, are able to get a lot of varied experiences. Um, they do a different practicum every seven weeks um, where some are able to really advance at their practicum sites by staying at the same place the entire year. Those practicums are, you have a site supervisor um, that's giving feedback throughout the whole time as well as someone, a faculty member that's also overseeing it. So a lot of feedback, like I said, kind of thought about myself in some ways. I like that feedback and I think it just makes us stronger. So. Um, we have a lot of opportunities for that. The courses, I looked at some of the successful master's programs out there that I'm familiar with. Um, some of, so, you know, even in sports psychology, I think a lot of that ties over into just sport in general, whether it's in athletic departments or with coaching specifically. So we have a coaching psychology class, which is pretty neat. Um, finishing up teaching that right now, where we look at how can we bring sports psychology to the teams through the coaches or um, into athletic departments through the AD. Or we also have to talk about how can coaches and athletic directors use sports psychology for themselves. And I think that's not something that many people have thought about just yet. I know in the research field, it's relatively new. Um, so for example, a lot of times we talk about, um, you know, I mentioned self-talk earlier. So making sure that our athletes have positive self-talk going into a competition, uh, but what kind of self-talk does that coach have? Um, and I think the coaches often want to look at strategies to help their athletes, but they don't know how to use those strategies to help themselves. And um, I, you know, I really put an emphasis on, you know, walking the talk. And so that's something we try to um, emphasize within the coaching psychology class. We also have um, a research methods class which is not a traditional like learning all about statistics and running analyses and stuff like that. It's more about how can we train people to find good research, good reliable research, and then be able to put that research into practice. 
I think a lot of times once people leave school, they stop looking at research. Um, and I think we have to do that more if we wanna bring in best practices. We have to be looking at recent research and then knowing how to apply what I read to day to day. So that's really the intent of the research methods class. Other than that, we have, I guess a unique aspect, um, I don't wanna to talk too much here, but a unique aspect of our program is a sport media and technology class, which I actually haven't seen at any other program. So if you're wondering why you should come to us, if you're interested in sport media, we even have a class that's specifically on that um, because we know in this day and age, um, social media is so huge in recruiting um, and learning about our athletes or our employees even. I mean, we, we'd be silly not to realize just how prevalent social media is um, and even how to promote our teams or, or our schools. So within that sport media and technology class, they learn how to navigate social media, um, best practices in promoting oneself or one's program. Um, and then they also learn about different types of technology that could potentially be used in coaching. So for example, uh, one of our teams right now is um, utilizing GPS software. They wear it um, whenever they have games and practices. And then we're able to use that information for research, but also to um, track if you know fatigue levels of athletes, um, which helps prevent overtraining um, or burnout. So, um, you know, there's lots of technology out there that's being developed every day, and some of it's more accessible than others, but it is helpful to know what might be helpful, um, redundant, but what might be helpful in each coach or um, for each coach or for each different sport. So that's kind of the, the purpose of sport media and tech. So I think that's a unique aspect and the students really enjoy it, um, because many of them more so than than us, you know, grew up kind of in that technology age. Our applications for next year, because we only start in the summer, uh, actually open on February 1st. And so uh, we will take applications, we call them like early applicants from February 1st to March 15th. Um, and at that point, we'll start reviewing applications and offering interviews. Um, after that, we generally admit on a rolling basis, um, just depending on size um, of the cohort and, and how many spots that we have left. So if you're interested, um, you can always contact me. My email is just mhalbrook, H-A-L-B-R-O-O-K, at randolphcollege.edu. Um, but you can also, if you just want to search more about the program in general, it's macsl.randolphcollege.edu, and that'll take you directly to the website. All right, very cool. We'll uh, give those addresses out again uh, at the end of the podcast. And for our listeners, we're recording this on December 6th, so you're going to be listening to it in a pretty timely manner, and you'll have plenty of time to uh, get in ahead of that February deadline. Uh, once again, we're visiting with Dr. Megan Halbrook. She's the program director for the Masters in Coaching and Sport Leadership at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. We're going to be back with some more, but let's take another quick break and hear from another podcast sponsor. We also want to say thank you to Wall of Fame by Vital Signs. You know, they are on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. They provide a variety of interactive touchscreen video consoles and an extensive library of templates to make it easier than ever to recognize the athletic achievements of your students, both past and present. For ideas on how to showcase your school's diverse history, along with your proudest moments, visit vitalsignswalloffame.com or learn more and get started with your own digital Wall of Fame tribute Call them at 614-981-3589 or email them at sales at vitalsignswalloffame.com. That's sales at vitalsignswalloffame.com. You won't be disappointed. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Dr. Halbrook, um, this is the part of the podcast where you know we try to get a little bit philosophical here. So I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, how can an athletic director or a head coach or a leader, 
Uh, how can an athletic director do a better job of being socially aware for their community, for their kids, their coaches, for everybody? Uh, do you have any advice for us? I, I do. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier a little bit, but as far as the importance of research, I think a lot of times once we enter an occupation, we get a little bit stuck um, in terms of, of reaching out and trying to find what's you know the new hot topic type of stuff and, and how we can approach it because we get a little bit set in our ways. And I think that one thing that I always, uh, you know, I heard this one time, most people probably have heard this, but it's the idea that we have two ears and one mouth. And we should really be listening much more than we are talking. And when it comes to social issues, I think that's a big part of it is we have to be willing to listen to individuals that have concerns um, and, and not immediately. Uh, a lot of times we, we plan to respond when we're listening instead of just listening. And a lot of times we need to just listen um, and just hear what someone is saying instead of trying to come up with some sort of response. I also think that as a whole sport is very reactive in terms of social issues that we essentially wait until something happens in order to fix it. Um, that we don't want to believe that something is um, possibly happening if we have no proof of it. Um, so instead we have to be better at being proactive. Um, even if something hasn't happened in our athletic department yet, that doesn't mean that it won't. Um, and it doesn't mean that you just don't know about it. And, you know, the locker room in itself is a very private place and some people are going to feel safe there and others aren't. And I think that we have to be proactive, um, in terms of policies, um, creating policies that are going to allow people to um, feel heard and be safe whenever they're participating in sport. And I think it also means that as individuals, we have to do our own research um, through reputable sources. And sometimes that research just comes in the form of talking to athletes or talking to coaches um, and building those relationships so that people feel safe coming to you with information. There's a lot of talk about people having open door policies. And um, I recently heard um, a coach say, you know, I'll tell an athlete, you know, my door's always open when I'm at my laziest. And I thought that was interesting because that puts all of the onus on the athlete to come to you um, and say that something's wrong. And sport is hierarchical, right? So sometimes athletes don't feel safe or like they are able to come and talk about something that's going on, even if the door is open. So that means that as leaders, we have to be out and about and asking those questions and not waiting for athletes or coaches to come to us um, to, to say something's wrong. You know, we really have to be on the ground, keeping our eyes and ears open, looking for things that maybe you're not exactly how they should be, and then addressing it right then, um, not waiting for it to get worse. You know, one person's safety and security is enough um, to target a response from someone. It should be. Um, and so I think that that's something that we really need to do more of is listen um, and then make those changes proactively instead of having a reactive response when something finally goes wrong. Yeah, you, you really hit it on the head, and, and you're right. We've heard that, you know, two ears, one mouth um, analogy many times, but it's it's so true. I, I know I've said this many times. It's a lesson I learned far too late in my career. <laughs> I wish I would have learned it earlier. And, uh, you know, the open door policy, I, I love the way that you phrase that, um, that you know, we as leaders, you know, we have to get out there. We have to be present in, in the student athletes presence, you know, not just in that uh, ivory tower with the door open. Uh, very, mm -hmm. very good stuff. Um, this has been really cool getting to know you a little bit and hearing about the program, but we're not done yet. Uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to find out what Dr. Halbrook is going to put into her 
Athletic Director Toolbox, which uh, is sponsored by Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. So stick with us and uh, we'll be right back with the Athletic Director's Toolbox segment. We really wanna thank Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack for sponsoring the Athletic Director's Toolbox segment of our podcast. Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack are a quick, easy and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire athletic program. Athletic surveys by Lifetrack also gives you access to the 95% of the players and the parents who really love your program. And it gives them a voice to help demonstrate the importance that a positive athletic experience has for them. Go to athleticsurveys.com and check out their testimonials, and then give them a call at 1-800-738-6466, or you can email them at info at athleticsurveys.com to get started. Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. If you've never taken the pulse of your student athletes or your parents, you're really missing out. Go to Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack and let them help you take your athletic program from good to great. Once again, we've been visiting with Dr. Megan Halbrook. She's the program director for the master's in coaching and sport leadership at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia. Dr. Halbrook, it is time to find out what you're gonna put in your athletic director toolbox. You certainly know your way around the world of athletics, but right now I'm gonna challenge you to send out a young athletic director on their very first job. So uh, what tools are gonna go in Dr. Megan Halbrook's athletic director toolbox? Oh man, okay. I have been giving this some thought. One thing that we actually physically send our master's students off with is a journal. And the journal is something that a big part of our program centers around the idea of self-reflection. And we know self-reflection can promote healthy growth and um, days are going to be hectic. Things are not always going to go as planned. Um, But instead of ruminating about those just internally, um, I always encourage our students to journal um, and to self-reflect. The game went great. What went well? Um, We we use the premise, good, better, how? Um, So what went good? What can we do better? And and how are we going to do that better? And really thinking that through game didn't go well, why not? You know, um, so the idea of self-reflection in, in a journal is something that I think is really, really valuable for everyone, um, whether you're young or older in the profession. The second thing I would say is a really good membership um, to some sort of organization that allows you continued professional development. So uh, similarly to the idea of research, and not always being able to access the newest research. I think professional development is something that a lot of people see as mandatory or something that they have to do instead of something that they should do or that they want to do. And so um, really engaging in continued professional development, whether it's going to conferences, whether it's doing online training, Um, online training is getting better and better. And so it's not always just clicking through slides anymore. Sometimes there's some really good stuff out there. So engage in professional development. I think that's a really useful tool um, for everyone. The third thing, I would say I'll probably pull on what I mentioned earlier. And that's the idea of having really good communication skills. Um, and you know, I think in the toolbox, there's still some perception that as a leader, that other people around me are going to conform to my leadership style or understand exactly what I'm saying. And that's not always true, right? Everyone communicates differently. And so having really good communication um, will help you build those strong relationships so that what you say um, you know, will be heard in a way that is optimistic um, and you'll be perceived as genuine and trustworthy, but that all starts with good communication. Um, So I would say good communication skills is definitely a great tool that we have to build. It's not something that everyone has naturally, 
and uh, engaging in professional development. Those are those are really important. And then self-reflecting on all of it. Great, great tools. Uh, I love the uh, the journaling part. Uh, again, something that I picked up, you know, way too late in my career. And of course, you know, being that lifelong learner, you know, engaging in the professional development and um, maximizing your communication uh, skills. Great, great tools. Uh, Dr. Albrecht, if one of our listeners wanted to reach out and uh, pick your brain a little bit more and even find out more about the program, what's the best way that they can get in touch with you? Yes, absolutely. I would love to keep the conversation going. Uh, my email will probably be the best bet. I uh, feel like I'm always on my email these days, but it's M Halbrook, H A L B R O O K, at Randolph College. Edu. And then the master's uh, program information, if you just want to look at that and then contact me, that is macsl.randolphcollege.edu. Yeah. Dr. Megan Halbrook, thank you so much for sharing and all the best with the uh, master's program moving forward. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Oh, it's been great. For our listeners, remember the Zoom recordings of these interviews are being uploaded to the Educational AD Podcast YouTube channel. We appreciate you listening today. Please come back again next time for another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. And we also want to say thank you to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. Learn more at hometownticketing.com. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing.